Good evening, everyone. My name is Edgar Rodriguez Dorans, and my pronouns are he and him. I am research officer for the Staff Pride Network, and I want to thank you all for being here for the third event of the Staff Pride Network Research Seminar Series, which aims to create a community of scholars working on LGBTQIA plus topics and communicate with a wider audience. We hope this endeavor helps to connect researchers at all stages of their careers working in the field. We've had a couple of interesting seminars already during the semester, and we hope that this, this seminar today is thought-provoking for you as well. Tonight, I want to introduce Gina Wenfrewi. Gina is currently completing her thesis at the University of Edinburgh in trans narratives, having also been a tutor at the University of Edinburgh in English literature and queer studies. With teaching opportunities at university currently at Premium, she now balances studies and research as a warehouse worker for Amazon. Her current interests, which she also blogs about, include gender critical feminism and different conceptions of both being a trans woman and of imagining trans activism and trans healthcare. In addition, she loves trans theater and blogs and writes research papers about it whenever possible. Currently, she has a chapter on the review on the work of Emma Falkland and Travis Alabanza to be incorporated in a book, hopefully in 2021. Gina presents tonight her talk, Transgender Gays, Neoliberal Haze, representations of trans women in the Americas through the prism of neoliberal society. Thank you very much, Gina, for accepting the invitation to participate in this. And now the microphone is yours. OK, thank you. Thanks to everybody for coming tonight to, to listen to this talk. I hope it's, it's good for you all. Um, first of all, then, my name's Gina, Gina Gofrawi, and pronouns she, her. Um, I'm in the process of completing my PhD. Uh, analyzing representations of trans women in the Americas through the prism of neoliberal culture and society. This talk, I hope, will take no more than 45 minutes. And I'll just tell you very briefly the structure. To begin with, I'm going to talk about The Danish Girl by David Abershoff, the, the novel from the, published in the year 2000, and my analysis of it and on the issue of privilege and gatekeeping. Um, then I'm going to look a little bit on liberal trans perspectives as typified by Sarah McBride in the United States. And then briefly, I'm going to reflect on some of the texts that I'm currently analyzing with my PhD. Um, I'll be looking at those that have enjoyed popularity in the mainstream and some which have been invisible in the mainstream. And I'll look at some reasons why that is. Okay, so without further ado, let's let's go into this. And I think the first thing I need to clarify is this word neoliberalism, which is quite contentious in some ways because it's so amorphous. Um, I rely a lot on Na Naomi Klein, the, the journalist, because she does such brilliant analysis of, of the impact of neoliberalism on the world, basically. So Klein gives a couple of examples of what it is. And I, I quote, its main characteristics are huge, uh, as a system are huge transfers of public wealth to private hands, often accompanied by exploding debt, an ever-widening chasm between the dazzling rich and the disposable poor, and an aggressive nationalism that justifies bottomless spending on security. Also in terms of policies, it's typified by privatization, government deregulation, and deep cuts to social spending. Um, and I think it's, it's useful to have a journalist's definition because I think there's a big difference between the rhetoric of neoliberalism and what it claims to produce in a society in terms of meritocracy, individualism, um, upward mobility and so forth, and the actual realities for many people. Um, there's a cultural theorist called Mark Fisher who's written a lot about the debilitating effects of neoliberal society on people. But he, he wrote in 2008 a very influential book called Capitalist Realism. Um, and I'll just quote a little bit from it in terms of the new possibilities that may emerge now post-2008 and the, the world economic crash. So 
Fisher talks about how, even if it's now evident that the credit crisis will not lead to the end of capitalism all by itself, the crisis has led to the relaxing of a certain kind of mental paralysis. We are now in a political landscape littered with what Alex Williams called ideological rubble. It is year zero again, and the space has been cleared for a new anti-capitalism to emerge, which is not necessarily tied to the old language or traditions. And it is interesting to see how much things have changed since 2008 and when Mark Fisher was writing this, of course, with the emergence in 2016 of populism in, in politics, um, and of course now the pandemic, really changing people's ideas of, of the state and what markets can do to help us. Okay, but firstly, in terms of the concepts that I, I wanna talk about, I do wanna establish that my PhD, originally it was going to be a celebration of, of transgender, female identity. Um, I came out actually around the same time that the PhD started. So that was around 2016. And I wanted the PhD to be a celebration just of the kind of trans women that, that I was seeing in, in the mainstream. Um, for example, Lana Wachowski, uh, Laura Jane Grace, um, Juliet Jakes. Many of them had published books. And I, I saw this as a really exciting new wave of trans female identity. Um, compared to the 20th century, which I'd experienced growing up, which was so terrible. You know, all the representations were either from horror or from comedy. And suddenly we had this new, mature, sophisticated kind of trans woman. And connected to this, there were academics who were producing brilliant research, like, for example, Eva Hayward, her very influential paper, Spider City Sex. And I, I quote a little bit from it when she asks, what is the somatic sociality of trans becoming by trans becoming, I mean an emergence of a material, psychical, sensual, and social self through corporeal, spatial, and temporal processes that transform the lived body. I love Eva Hayward's writing. It's, it's almost hypnotic and intoxicating in the way that she combines autoethnographic diary writing with her, her very intellectual um, analysis of gender and trans female experience is something very different. We, we see it because I'm currently looking a lot at gender critical feminism, which tries to negate a lot of trans female identity. But Haywood really captures the corporeal um, transformations that, that can occur. And I really identified with this. And it was one of the first times where I thought, wow, she's really speaking to me. It makes you really proud and even feel quite sexy kind of reading her, her prose. And so, I wanted my PhD to be a celebration of trans female identity. Okay, so year one of the PhD originally was going to be about looking at the Danish girl, the, the novel, which in some ways signaled the beginning of the 21st century in terms of trans representations, and to do a comparative work on the book that it's based on, Man into Woman, and the biography of Lily Alba, the, Danish, the original Danish girl, published in Danish in 1931, then in German, 32, and then in English, in American, Britain in 33. And this is arguably the first high profile trans female biography that would effectively establish the standard of, of trans female bi biographies for the rest of the 20th century. Very hyper feminine mediated text um, for a cisgender market. And so after comparing those two, I wanted to then just celebrate Laura Jane Grace, her, her book, um, Trani, and Juliet Jakes, um, her memoir, Trans the Memoir, Lana Wachowski's work I wanted to look at. Also, anybody who's gonna study trans, trans identity academically, there, there are almost, it's almost like the Bible of, of trans studies, which is trans studies reader volumes one and two. And then there's, of course, queer theory, Michel Foucault, Judith Butler, deconstructing gender and sex. And also um, Jacques Lacan in terms of looking at patriarchy, or as I would uh, rephrase it slightly, cis-heteropatriarchy. Basically, we live in a, in, a privileged society, in a society that privileges cisgender identity, heteronormative identity, and patriarchal identity. Um, so, Let's, let's move on to the Danish girl itself. And what I discovered as I was analyzing it and also analyzing the thoughts and reflections of the author afterwards, is just how problematic a text it really is. And so I'm just gonna read some points to you uh, based on the reflections I come up with in, in my analysis, in my thesis. 
So first of all, the Danish girl novel by David Abershoff, it comes across as a cisgender male castration fantasy presented as lit literary realism. It's focused on the sensation of wearing women's clothing, Lily's effortless switch to becoming an attractive female and her passive journey to womanhood at the prompting of her wife aligns the story with transvestite pornography. Einar slash Lily's wife, whose name is Goethe, is like a wife in a fetishistic fantasy, never complaining, always encouraging, and even demanding the transitioning. The author, Abishoff, has removed Lily's ties to her family, e.g. her three siblings and her mother, um, also removed or, or mediated the practicalities of transition. So there's no reference to money troubles as there are in the original book, the original biography. Um, no reference to the need for her to return to her former career as an arts teacher. In the novel, Abishoff has invented a new career for her as working at the counter of a, of a perfumery, basically a, a, a female only space as it were. And the psychological impact on Lily Elba, her recurring paranoia and insecurity and not passing, her desire to hide away. This is pretty much taken away by Abishoff who, who kind of produces this fantasy thing of nobody can really tell that, that Lily is, is transgender. It's just, she immediately becomes this very attractive woman. Um, there's little focus on Lily's interior conflicts. Instead, we get a lot of detail on the pain caused by her surgery. This confirms the thematic focus on figurative, social, and physical castration. This is, these are the areas that um, David Abishoff is really seems to be interested in, not the psychological impact of transitioning. Um, but really just the physical consequences, a very cinematic kind of reading of, of transition produced within this kind of dramatic moment where Lily Alba accidentally becomes trans transgender almost. Um, the things that David Abishoff doesn't seem to realize about the original book as well, which I think are worth, worth highlighting, given that it is supposed to be a biography, but as Pamela Coffey and, and Sabina Meyer also notes, that the story is presented has been produced by multiple agents and told in differing versions so that it cannot be taken at face value as the story of Lily Alvini's life. Lily Alvina's being the Lily Alba's official name. And so Ernst Ludwig Harden, who in the book is presented as Niels Hoyer, as well as Lily Alba, as well as Gerda Wegener, the wife, as well as Lulu Lassen, the journalist, all have a, a kind of vague, ambiguous relationship to the authorship of, of the, the diary, of the book, sorry. And so it's very unclear what Lily Yelba's voice actually is. It is an incredibly mediated text with various people affecting the writing of it. Um, there's also very suspect medical um, information in, in the original biography, which Abishoff uses without actually questioning or challenging why it's in there. So again, and I, I quote from Maya and, and Coffey, medical information is drawn from the practitioner, Kurt Vornacross, whose medical insight contrasts significantly from Elba's original medical authority, Magnus Hirschfeld. Vornacross appears to be promoting a narrative of Elba, Elba as a pseudo hermaphrodite that legitimizes Elba in being able to obtain identification papers, a clear clash of interests in the supposed integri integrity of his medical testimony. Um, Von Kruss's position is undermined by the original examinations supervised by Hirschfeld, who, according to Coffey and Meyer's research, states that Lily Alba exhibited no traces of physical hermaphroditism, not even pronounced an androgyny. So the things that Abishop latches onto, th these kind of menstrual nosebleeds that happen once a month and so on, and the, the physical pains arguably were added by, me by medical people in order to help Lily Alba transition um, legally. So it wasn't really to do with the reality of, of her actual experience. Um, David Abishoff's reflections on his own writing are also, I think, really problematic, especially his sense of entitlement and sense of neutrality in being able to tell the story of transgender women. Um, unlike, for example, transgender women themselves, whom he seems to portray as being political and as having an agenda. So for example, he says in an interview at the back of the novel, so with Lily, I decided I wanted the reader to understand the version of her life as she perceived it, not as we perceive it for, from today, which asks, asks the question for me of, well, 
when is Ebishoff writing? And how is he operating outside of, of today? How is he able to get outside of this? How is he not influenced by his own prejudices? And so he continues, I understand and welcome the impulse to lionize her and define her story within the context of our own understanding of what it means to be trans today. But the Danish girl tries to bring the reader into her interior life, which is fundamentally different from trying to place her in history. Again, a very problematic phrase here worth unpacking. First of all, the I understand and welcome, but. So who is it who's trying to lionize Lily Alba? I see this as clearly targeted towards trans academics, trans activists, people who might celebrate Lily Alba, or not even celebrate, but try and have a more nuanced opinion on Lily Alba rather than his more negative um, representation. And the way he, he uses words like lionize as if any representation of Lily Alba that makes her look any better than his own is, an, is almost like an agenda. Um, whereas he's producing this kind of neutral voice, he's producing Lily Alba's true voice, which is an, a remarkable statement from someone who wrote this novel at the end of the 1990s, a white, probably upper middle class, to be honest, uh, a cisgender male from, from the United States, who has very little understanding of the complex um, elements that, that constructed the original biography. Um, so Abishoff's position is very problematic. He does not search and investigate his own um, influences. Serrano, Julia Serrano, the, the trans academic, um, talks about other cisgender appropriations of trans narratives. Um, she talks about Jeffrey Eugenides and, and a TV show, and she talks about the writers. And I quote, these writers took two of the most maligned and misunderstood sexual minorities in existence, hollowed them out and poured in their own non-intersex cissexual biases, inclinations and impressions, which in turn profoundly shape and solidifies a naive audience's opinions about transsexuals and intersex people. And Serrano concludes, for writers who have never had to deal with being transsexual or intersex to lay claim, to those experiences, to use them for their own purposes and to profit from them is nothing short of exploitation. I find Serrano's analysis very prescient and wholly applicable to David Ebershop's appropriation of the story of Lily Alba, which enriched him immensely. Um, so my chapter's conclusions on Ebershop's The Danish Girl, first of all, an author's cisgender castration narrative, and I quote, Yet while Abishop's cinematic piece fails to demonstrate nuance about Lily's testimony, it does reveal the durability of the appeal to cisgender concepts of a male castration narrative involving figurative and physical motifs for which the story of the transgender woman is appropriated as a suitable vehicle. This includes the unconvincingly effortless switch from male to sexually alluring female and their erotic consignment from a public sphere of empowerment to another of disempowerment signified and initiated by Einar slash Lily's submission, seduction, and encasement in women's underwear. My chapter's conclusion on Abishoff regarding privilege and gatekeeping, meanwhile. Abishoff's personal engagement with the story, meanwhile, also serves as a resonant example of the power of privilege in the shaping of transgender narratives in the public consciousness. Already occupying positions of empowerment in the literary industry by the time of the book's publishing, as publishing director of the Modern Library and editor at Random House, Abishop's reward for writing The Danish Girl includes winning the Lambda Literary Award for representing transgender identity. In the development of his relationship with Lambda Awards, a place for Abishop, now evidently assumed an expert on trans people, is provided on the Lambda Literary Leadership Council as one of its group of visionary leaders, lambdaliterary.org. This includes Abishoff establishing with Lambda Literary the Lily Alba Scholarship for Emerging Transgender Writers. So my chapter's conclusion on this. An instructive narrative becomes complete. A cisgender writer creates a castration fantasy that accords with the assumptions of a cis-dominated society and its gatekeeping institutions about trans female identity. His derivative work becomes a definitive cultural statement on transgender women and his patronage now becomes vital to future writers of trans identity. It is this narrative of the empowerment of David Abishoff as the gatekeeper of trans female identity that is arguably the most compelling storyline of the Danish girl. 
So as you can probably tell, I'm not a big fan of The Danish Girl as the novel. And of course, some 15 years later, the film um, was released, a big Hollywood production starring Eddie Redmayne, the cisgender actor, as Lily Alba. And this film, in some ways, is less pro problematic. They're trying to mediate, I think, a lot more um, trans, trans rights, trans identity. A lot has happened in, in those intervening years where they're trying to be more accommodating, though nevertheless, Eddie Redmayne's performance, it's very superficial. It's, it's, it really seizes on, in Redmayne's own words, the fact that he's, he's portraying a trans woman during a hyper-feminine hyper period. Um, and it, it comes across, it's, it's, there's a lack of nuance, there's a lack of development. She's all coy expressions and um, a, a refusal to look people in the eyes. Part of the, the thing that I noticed about the transgender gaze, and in this film, we don't see it. We see a male gaze on, on Lily Alba. Um, but I did want to include one quote about the Danish girl movie, which is not to do with the actual film. It's again to do with the issue of privilege and gatekeeping. I want to talk briefly about the script writer who adapted the novel into the film, Lucinda Coxton. And she had an online interview, which I found very interesting in terms of showing the access that these people have and the influence that they have. So Coxon, the scriptwriter, in an online interview says, I'm sitting in Washington, DC. If you could see outside of the window, the White House is just behind me. I'm here because we were in the White House yesterday with this film, we were asked to screen it here. President Obama is the first president ever to use the word transgender and has been a great supporter of the LGBT plus community. And we were here as part of a Champions of Change event. So as you can see, as with Abishoff, Lucinda Coxon, a cisgender writer, who also is representing Lily Alba through her own, her own cisgender conceptions, is now being invited to the White House to present a work on what it is to be transgender extremely problematic. Again, we see the privilege, we see the gatekeeping. Barack Obama will learn about transgender people and the policy makers will accordingly based on these cisgender artistic ideas of what it is to be trans. Okay. This leads me to a broader problem potentially with trans activism, um, that it can be dominated certainly in the United States, but I would argue equally in, in Britain um, with white middle-class, even upper middle-class, um, activists. So for example, Sarah McBride is a very good example. Now I have a lot of time for Sarah McBride. I admire her greatly. She comes from a very privileged background in the United States. She's brought up in Delaware with a family, family connections to Joe Biden. Um, she became an intern in her early 20s in the White House and gets, has very strong connections to Joe Biden. Um, and now she's a senator, in fact, she's just been voted in. And so great, great achievements for her. But in her book, which her memoir, which came out in 2018, she talks about her admiration of Hillary Clinton. And so I quote, throughout the election, Hillary Clinton had run the most trans-inclusive campaign in history. She had endorsed all the major policy goals um, of the trans community, lifted up trans people and voices, and consistently included trans people explicitly in her vision for a kinder, more welcoming country. Sarah McBride here claiming that Hillary Clinton represents all trans people reveals the, the kind of myopia or the, the very narrow lens through which Sarah McBride is, is operating. Um, as I'll, we will look at later in this talk, there are many trans people and indeed in the United States trans communities who absolutely have nothing to do with the politics of Hillary Clinton. They want a far more redistributive kind of society focusing on issues like racism, on, on the structural oppressions that, that people experience. Um, and just to have a look at what Naomi Klein says as a, as a journalist in her criticism of, of Hillary Clinton, which I think is very prescient. Sorry, this is a long quote, but I think it is worth and going through this to understand why Hillary Clinton is so problematic. So I quote, if there was a problem with Hillary Clinton's focus on gender, sexuality, and racial identity, it was that Clinton's brand of identity politics does not challenge the system that produced and entrenched these inequalities, but seeks only to make that system more inclusive. So yes, to marriage equality and abortion access and transgender bathrooms, but forget about the right to housing, the right to a wage that supports a family, 
brackets. Clinton resisted the call for a $15 minimum wage, end close brackets. The universal right to free healthcare or anything else that requires serious redistribution of wealth from top to bottom and would mean challenging the neoliberal playbook. On the campaign trail, Clinton mocked her opponents trumped up, trumped up trickle down economics, but her own philosophy is what we might call trickle down identity politics. Tweak the system just enough to change the genders, colors and sexual orientation of some of the people at the top and wait for the justice to trickle down to everyone else. And it turns out that trickle down works just about as well in the identity sphere as it does in the economic one. There are lots of examples of trans activism in the USA, which is absolutely counter to, to the kind of politics embodied by Hillary Clinton, in fact. So this is one example called Against Equality. This is more generally, um, they cover LGBT. So they are a small vo all volunteer anti-capitalist collective based in North America that maintains an online archive of radical queer and trans critiques of the holy trinity of mainstream gay and lesbian politics gay marriage, gays in the military, and hate crime legislation. And they say, we've deliberately eschewed a non-profit structure preferring to operate as a collective. So as you study these, these alternative um, collectives within North America, but they also exist in Britain, um, you see a very different kind of activism with different activist goals. Hillary Clinton certainly does not have, um, does not reflect all of the trans communities and their, and their policies. So Sarah McBride, coming at policy making from her own prejudices. And so we see generally a problem of privilege and gatekeeping. Okay, this, I don't think you can see the top of this. So, but generally then I'm looking at the theme of the neoliberal impact on, on representations of trans women. The transgender woman is in some ways the poster child of neoliberal America. Janet Mock writes a, a very, very, um, I, I think, perceptive memoir called Redefining Realness about her own relationship with fame and with celebrity, that she's very aware that she has become the right kind of trans woman, the kind of trans woman who's allowed access into the mainstream. And this is a very key quote, I think, and, and I, I'll quote it here. I have been held up consistently as a token, as the right kind of trans woman, brackets, educated, able-bodied, attractive, articulate, heteronormative, End quote, end bracket, sorry. It promotes the delusion that because I made it, that level of success is easily accessible to all young trans women. Let's be clear, it is not. And you'll see that I've got the picture of Laverne Cox from Time Magazine from 2014, um, the transgender tipping point, America's next civil rights frontier. And I think this image is very powerful. I think it's also very deliberate. We have a woman of color who is transgender, indicating that in America, anybody can be anything. Um, there are no real obstacles if you work hard enough, irrespective of racism, irrespective of transphobia or homophobia or whatever. So very powerful symbolism. But of course, as Mock says, it's a very limited kind of view of the kind of trans women who are out there. This is a very specific, perfect kind of neoliberal identity. Um, connected to that is, is the concept of homonormativity which I think Lisa Duggan does a really good job of analyzing um, a kind of accessible um, transgender identity, accessible trans rights, and the same generally with gay rights as well. So Duggan says, the new ne neoliberal sexual politics might be termed the new homonormativity. It is a politics that does not contest dominant heteronormative assumptions and in institutions, but upholds and sustains them while promising the possibility of a demobilized gay constituency in a privatized, depoliticized gay culture or trans culture anchored in domesticity and consumption. So as I went into year three after doing a lot of this kind of reading and lots of reading that led me down lots of cul-de-sacs, um, I came to the conclusion that Sarah McBride and writers like Maggie Nelson talking about the queer, about queer activism, um, they represented one part of, of, of trans, trans identity in terms of what we see in the mainstream, but there were lots of other alternative narratives, parallel narratives that we didn't see. Um, from reading Trapdoor, for example, which is almost like an archive of trans and queer people of color in North America, 
um, the queer and trans artists of color volume one and two with Mia King. These were all incredible texts that gave me a very different view of, of trans identities in, in, in North America. Um, other books that were really key, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, um, From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation by Kianga Yamata Taylor. And I cite these texts here because what I want to say is that it wasn't just transgender analysis that helped me to understand the lives and, and the perspectives of trans women of color as they were writing. Um, it, the transgender analysis was insufficient. You also had to really read about racism at a structural level to understand where they were coming from. So in effect, the simplified idea of being able to understand trans identity just from trans um, scholarship, it doesn't work like that. We have much more complex oppressions, multiple oppressions happening to certain um, trans communities. And um, one writer that really helped me understand this was Maria Lugones, her post-colonial feminism. I think Lugones is from Argentina. She wrote a lot about her experiences also as an academic working in North America. And she talks about racism, not as a kind of individual hate crime, but as a cultural institutional um, form of oppression. And I'll, I'll quote what she says here. It's one's affirmation or acquiescence to or lack of recognition of the structures and mechanisms of the racial state. One's lack of awareness or blindness or indifference to one's being racialized. One's affirmation or indifference or blindness to the harm that the racial state afflicts on some of its members. And this idea of the United States, for example, as a racial state, um, it's, it's so anathema to, to the image of the United States, the one that it, that it wants to have, that um, it's basically, make, it makes it impossible for certain narratives to emerge into the mainstream because they are so counter to that, to that kind of narrative. Um, Lagones also talks very usefully about ethnocentrism, which as a scholar, as a white scholar, it's really important to understand your own kind of position. So she says, for example, being unaware of one's own ethnicity and racialization commits the inquirer to adopt a disengaged stance, one from outside the racial state and the ethnocentric culture looking in, but it is one's culture and one's society that one is looking at. Disengagement as a sanctioned ethnocentric racist strategy works as follows. You do not see me because you do not see yourself and you do not see yourself because you declare yourself outside of culture. Already as I'm reading this, I'm also thinking of David Abershoff writing about transgender people. He doesn't see himself as, as in terms of his own, the, the inf social influences on his work. He sees himself outside of culture as a neutral voice. And that's incredibly dangerous because if there's one thing we learn from Abishoff is the prejudices will um, be there in your text. And the less aware you are of, of, of the, the forces, the social forces that have produced your own um, views, the less aware you are of those, then the more likely they are of, of seriously affecting your writing. And Lugones finishes, declaring yourself outside of culture is self-deceiving. The deception hides your seeing only through the eyes of your culture. So disengagement is a radical form of passivity towards the ideology of the ethnocentric racial state that privileges the dominant culture as the only culture to see with and conceives this as seeing it as, as to be done non-self-consciously. Okay. Kianga Yamata Taylor on the new neoliberal iterations of white supremacy, meanwhile. So I'm gravitating now towards a, a real post-colonial focus on, on the texts that I'm about to study, moving away to some degree from trans academics. So she talks about um, just the, the oppressions that, that women of color and people of color suffer in North America. And so I quote, the success of a relative view African-Americans as upheld as vindication of the United States colorblind ethos and a testament to the transcendence of its racist past. Yeah, and we see this in the mainstream. We, we see this even with the trans women of color who do make it to the mainstream. They have to be very careful in what they say, the messages they produce, if they wanna make it into that mainstream. And that's something you have to be very aware of when you're studying and analyzing these texts. You have to be aware that the texts that are out there in the mainstream are going to be extremely mediated or otherwise they wouldn't be there. So Taylor continues, here as in the rest of the world, the neoliberal era of free market reform, the rollback of social spending, 
and cuts in taxes for corporations and the wealthy have produced social inequality on a scale unseen since at least the 1920s. Yes, and yet we don't really see this in mainstream trans narratives. Um, instead, we get the success story. We get the upwardly mobile, successful trans woman um, with her transitioning arc making it in America. And so Taylor finishes by saying, Black revolutionary Stokely Carmichael and social scientist Charles Hamilton coined the phrase institutional racism in their book, Black Power. The term was prescient and anticipating the coming turn towards color blindness and the idea that racism was only present if the intention was undeniable. Institutional racism or structural racism can be defined as the policies, programs, and practices of public and private institutions that result in greater rates of poverty, disposition, dispossession, criminalization, illness, and ultimately the mortality of African-Americans. And not just African-Americans too. Um, I, I focus a lot on, um, for example, Jamie Baruch, who who's um, Hispanic American, but um, these positions are really important in connecting post-colonialism and trans experience um, within North America, which is really where I focused on a lot and understanding it's not just Sarah McBride's conception of trans identity, there are other oppressions that are absolutely key to understanding the, the oppressions happening. So year three, let me check for time, okay, I better speed up. Um, I look at Kiss of the Spider Woman, um, a Freudian narrative accessible to mainstream audiences in the Anglophone Global North. The original novel from 1977, it's, in fact, it's a brilliant novel. It's, it, the, the idea is brilliant as well. It's, it's two prisoners in a cell, one is this very ambiguous queer slash trans character who's in jail um, for reasons relating to their identity. And they're sharing the cell with a socialist kind of macho guy. That, and to begin with, they're very suspicious of each other and generally um, love kind of blossoms, certainly on one side. And it's, it's a very interesting Socratic dialogue that develops between them as they learn to understand each other. Um, the movie, on the other hand, um, well, because it's, it's of course, a, a visual medium, so the original androgyny and ambiguity of the character known as Melina, basically they have to make a choice. How are we going to represent this person? And you really see the importance of appearance and physicality and visual clues to gender identity, to sex gender identity. And so they opt to make Melina a gay man. And for American audiences, I guess, they, they choose William Hurt, who, who really isn't suited for the part. He, he for, for many reasons, and in the making of the, this film, in, the, in terms of the documentary, it talks about the struggles they had to try to make him more feminine, for example, that the choreography he had, he had to work on to kind of develop a more feminine um, body language, and um, all kinds of signifiers that were vital, that weren't necessary in the book. And this construction of Molina's gender identity in a visual way that would work with audiences is absolutely fascinating in terms of deconstructing gender and sex and seeing the importance of the visual. Um, other texts that I looked at from South America, A Fantastic Woman and Miss Maria Skirting the Mountain. Let's talk about A Fantastic Woman first because it did very well in Hollywood, for example, it won the best foreign film. And you can see why she's uh, the character, um, Ma Marina, sorry, who is played by Daniela Vega. It's, it, she does a brilliant job with the character. Um, it's very much a 21st century kind of trans woman. It has the kind of recognizable problems dealing with administration, dealing with transphobia, um, dealing with love as well, and, and the problems of dealing with the family of, of her deceased former lover. Um, so it's, it's a very engaging film, but nevertheless, by the end, very curious arc, in, which really focuses on her getting her own apartment and her own upward mo mobility and being able to sing an aria in this very prestigious concert, which really had very little to do with the, the opening of the film. I thought this was a very strange symbolic ending. I thought this is almost like the perfect neoliberal film of this very beautiful trans woman who who has an amazing voice, um, amazing singing voice, which for me is, is very um, unusual, of course, as a trans woman who's done lots of, of very unsuccessful voice therapy, just seeing how 
not only does she have a passable voice, she has an amazing world-class singing voice. So she really is a very distinctive, um, successful kind of right kind of trans woman. And I don't doubt that the film is is very accessible in in the kind of kind of identity that it's presenting. Contrasted to that, Miss Maria skirting the mountain, this trans woman living in the foothills of, of Colombia, um, not even aware, it seems, of words like transgender, of the opportunities of things like transitioning. She simply has always identified as, as a woman despite being assigned male at birth. And it's a very harrowing documentary. You see the difficulty she has living with the community, the very Catholic community, a, a superstitiously Catholic community um, in the rural part of Colombia, um, children laughing in the streets, people talking about her with a huge amount of disrespect. She is also a very uh, indomitable spirit. She, she she's there at the end smiling and just carrying on her life. And what's interesting about this documentary as well is pretty much nothing changes throughout the whole documentary. What we have at the beginning is what we have at the end. It is absolutely the opposite of Marina's journey in, in a fantastic woman. Of course, it's a different genre as well. It's a documentary. And I, I found the fact that it was such an unsuccessful documentary. I saw it at the Edinburgh Film Festival in 2017 and it disappeared uh, without trace. I tried to get a copy from um, Habanero um, distributors who, who distribute the film, they, they wouldn't release it, except at a ridiculous cost in hundreds, hundreds of, of pounds, and Edinburgh University couldn't get a copy from them either. And I found that narrative in itself, the impossibility of getting a copy of this documentary, um, really insightful in terms of which representations make it to the, to the big screen and then become successful and which do not, which just disappear. Um, and it's the, those neoliberal kind of upwardly soci socially upward, upwardly mobile kind of narratives which make um, some trans women so attractive um, in the mainstream, whereas others presenting much more complex stories, um, less popular. Another really key text was Trauma Queen by Loven Corazon from 2013. Again, I mean, this is a text that's... Um, now you, no longer uh, available. Um, it's out of print. It's been out of print for several years, which is a real shame because talking about 20th century uh, biographies, such as the original by Lily Alba, which are very kind of prescriptive and 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 very strict in in what they produce. This very hyper feminine, asexual, apolitical, white middle class trans woman, usually transitioning in their forties. This is a very different proposition. This is a, a young trans woman of color from California, um, very confident, very thoughtful, very insightful. And I'll just read the, the main points. So it's the teenage memoir of a millennial and trans woman, non-binary femme of color in California. The breaking of the biographical mold for a trans person includes in this book, sex and sexuality. That's a lot of sex, that's a lot of sexuality um, because Corazon loves sex and uh, talks about it a lot. Um, she talks about her, sorry, not she, they. They talk about their adolescence. Um, they talk a lot about sexual abuse and trauma as well. It's a very heavy um, memoir. They talk a lot about racism um, in the United States. Similar to other texts that I look at, they effectively represent the USA as a white supremacist state. Very different from the Sarah McBride idea of, of the USA and trans the goals of trans activism. Corazon also talks, yeah, about class and the failure of capitalism. She, um, they talk a lot about poverty, um, growing up in the USA as, as a person of color and all the oppressions that they, they, they face. This is a very different kind of text, not from a, a middle-aged person, but from a teenager. And um, yeah, it's definitely one I would recommend for anyone who can get their hands on, on this particular book. Another key text is Janet Mock's Redefining Realness. Mock identifies herself as the right kind of trans woman for neoliberal USA and an exception to the rule. Her influences growing up are other black women, her mother, her aunts, and from the world of music, Beyonce and Janet Jackson. And Mock's upbringing shows how transness develops not through transgender ideology as it can be presented in the mainstream media, but through local personalized social influences. And I think this is a really interesting 
a reflection of trans female identity. It's not this kind of ideology that comes from a particular central space of activism. It's people growing up, being influenced by those around them, identifying with those around them, and then afterwards keying in on, on this language of transgender to make sense of, of this experience. Mm. I also looked up another key text, a documentary, Free CC by CC McDonald, Laverne Cox, and Jack Garez, multiple oppressions experienced by socioeconomically disadvantaged trans women of color. So the story of CC McDonald, 2012, um, CC McDonald was attacked in the street by some white supremacists. She defended herself, killing one of the assailants. And she was put away for two years on a manslaughter charge until eventually, I think because of the protests, she was um, released and has since become an activist um, against, well, she's an abolitionist. So um, an activist against mass incarceration in the United States and its targeting of people of color. So this is a very political, powerful documentary. And um, again, this is a million miles away from Sarah McBride and the focus on marriage rights, for example, this is about simply surviving as a woman of color, as a trans woman of color. It deals with transphobia and it deals with racism. And Chase Strangio, the, the attorney who talks in, in the documentary, says from the start, and I quote, they weren't conceiving of the hate crime against CC McDonald. They didn't care that she was being targeted. What they wanted was to get evidence that she was angry and intended harm. The minute that CC was brought into interrogation, it was clear that the individuals in the entire system did not understand her to be a victim. This is a system that does not understand trans people to occupy the status of victimhood. Uh, it's a really interesting documentary. It's quite an un uneven one. And I think it kind of has to be because she is balancing a personal story with a, a structural analysis, the kind that you won't see in Janet Mock's um, Redefining Realness. McDonald is, is far more polemic um, and clear in, in offering solutions, saying we have to deal with these structural issues. And um, perhaps because of that, it's, it's not a text which is as famous as some other texts, but is well worth looking at. Very quickly, a, a few other texts that I looked at because I'm really into cyberpunk and science fiction. And I love the idea of um, well, the, the overlaps between cyborg identity and, and trans identity in terms of the, the social anxieties of the artificial woman and the threat of this artificial woman, etc. cetera. Um, so this is a short story by Mary Kurisato, who's a, a queer woman of color, um, Native American writer in, in the USA. And she talks about her character, Angie, almost passed for human. Her gestures were natural. Her eyelashes fluttered in the right way. Her breathing was perfect. Still, she failed to completely shed her old self. Yeah, these overlaps, these parallels, um, and the harassment that she, she receives. So for example, on, on one occasion, and I quote, you think your injections and implants can fool us? We know what you are, you deceptive little witch. You can do all the pills and surgeries you want. You'll always be the same trashy non-citizen. So we have this character who's a cyborg, but also has transgender kind of leanings. And um, it also deals with Native American women in, in the US and the, the huge issue of violence that they face. Um, so it's also a very post-colonial text. Kurosato, a very talented writer. Um, not perhaps a very well-known short story, but that's not because it's not brilliant. Again, it's about gatekeeping, I think. And finally, <laughs> Jamie Baruch, arguably the artist that I'm most fascinated with. So she's a Mexican, US-based Mexican trans writer, editor, and activist. Um, Baruch talks about the publishing industry and her own desire for independence from it, following just her frustration and exasperation with it. So uh, she writes about it in different ways, in essays, in, in forewords to some of the books that she's edited. Um, this is from one of those books, a collection of short stories of various trans, trans and queer women of color. So she says, the systematic racism that means nine out of 10 editors in the publishing world are white. The quiet white supremacist hearts of those editors who hold multiple liberal art degrees and reflective, reflexively deny equal opportunities to writers of color. The hatred of trans women that's endemic in every quarter and has us on the desolate margins of whatever marginal community we find ourselves at so that a writer like us among cisgender writers and editors of color still cannot find a place, cannot fit into their exclusive publishing guidelines. 
Their inability to give the support we need to survive while we write, their demands for bland, neoliberal, faux universal narratives of cis, hetero, people of color life. Yeah, th when I read this, especially those final words, I did think a little bit of Janet Mock's book, Redefining Re Realness, which is a mainstream book. And it is, to some degree, it is that faux universal narrative of cis, hetero, POC life of just wanting a better life and just um, getting almost by the end of the sex in the city kind of lifestyle. Um, Baruch just kind of attacks that and says, I'm not going to play that game. I think America is a racist state. I think capitalism is an evil system. I'm not going to hold back from that. And her short story writing, for example, absolutely deals with those issues. Um, and she talks about the difficulty, the material difficulty as a result of being outside the system. So for example, in early 2017, I found myself not only exhausted, but also struggling to make rent because I hadn't been focusing enough on doing work that paid. I set aside the anthology and wrote an entire collection of my own speculative short fiction in the first half of 2017, while also relying on freelance editing and sex work so that I could pay the bills. So yeah, a lot of risks that have to be taken to simply exist as a woman of color who wants to do something with her life without being able to enter the, the kind of the legitimate system of the mainstream. And Jimmy Brute's conclusion, is this is in an essay in, in May 2019, the need to organize and build systems towards accountability and start taking collective action to reject meritocracy, end publishing and destroy this pillar of capitalism and settler colonialism. These are radical political ideas when you compare them to Sarah McBride and her, her celebration of Hillary Clinton. So again, we see very different types of trans activisms, trans goals, and we need to, I get, just understand the, these differences and not think that the way we see the world is the way other trans women will see them as well. Okay, so um, Baruch writes in her book of short stories, several short stories. My favorite one is Waiting Room. Um, I love the premise. It's about a transgender woman of color in, in a waiting room. She's about to have facial feminization surgery. She meets an android woman who wants to have similar surgery. This is a little bit in the future when there are android women. And again, this overlap between the cyborg and the transgender woman. And so um, the, the transgender female character says, for example, I was trying to carve out a, a new kind of freedom for myself through the sum of half a dozen slight adjustments meant to make my face and voice more immediately recognizable as feminine and attractive, and in particular, emphatically not masculine. And she was likely there for a similar set of adjustments with the goal of making her face her own too. So they start to bond as they're talking and, to, and they share their experiences. And at the end, the android woman produces this monologue, which is so beautiful. I sometimes get emotional when I read it, and so I've just kept the last two parts of it. And it's about the idea of, realizing your own isolation and then reaching out and finding solidarity with like-minded people. Um, yeah, and I'll just quote these two, these two parts. So this is from the Android woman, but I think there is such an overlap with, with trans experience as well. And I quote, so for the first time I extended my consciousness out, devoted all my processing to the searching quietly in every communications network, eluding the hunter bots and traps that lay in wait for prying androids, I found a back way for each of us onto our own desolate channel. We were all together in a way we had not been since our birth on the factory floor. For a few minutes, before our presence was discovered, before each of us fled back to our separate selves, we heard one another. We embraced. There were countless voices, each of us a singular voice calling out from the darkness, each of us with distinct emotions, temperaments, and traumas each of us powerful and mysterious, even to one another. Those minutes were enough to fill a lifetime. There we lived among family, building a new world, sharing our stories, making art, arguing as families do, and learning from each other. Then it was over. The meeting changed each of us. I realized there is so much more beyond myself and the Android 503s. More, more, always there is more. And someday, someday soon, all of us will join together and no one will ever again suffer as we have. So the conflict addressed at the heart of the thesis, who gets to tell the stories about trans people? As Emily Skidmore says, 
researchers must pay as much attention to the structures regulating visibility, both within today's archives and within yesterday's representations, as we do to the representations themselves. And that's as true for academics as it should be for activists. So the thesis structure, um, I open with an introduction and methodology. At chapter zero, I talk about the Danish girl, um, and then I talk about the, the text that I've discussed here today. And so the thesis statement is, in what way does neoliberal society in the Anglophone global north depict trans women's lives from the Americas? What kind of narratives are being occluded from the mainstream concerning the latter? What does this reveal about the impact of neoliberalism on disempowered trans lives? There are complex uh, things that I look at and the reflections I, I produce, it's too much to talk about um, here, but I hope you've had some kind of idea of the kind of inequalities that I'm looking at and their relationship with visibility and representation. And that's my PhD. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gina. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name's Jonathan McBride. My pronouns are he, him. I'm one of the two co-chairs of the Staff Pride Network. Uh, unfortunately, my fellow co-chair, Katie, uh, cannot be here this evening, um, uh, but uh, you've got me uh, hosting the Q&A. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I hope you find it as fascinating as I did, the interaction, the differences. I try to learn uh, and about other people and uh, Gina, oh, while trans and non-binary rep for the Staff Pride Network, educated me greatly uh, and continues to do so. Uh, I'm really delighted that you've been able to complete your PhD uh, and thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, so now, uh, if I can open it out to our audience for any questions or comments, there's lots of thanks uh, Gina, uh, in the <laughs> chat, um, from, uh, that was really interesting, <laughs> thanks so much, <laughs> amazing talk, just, just lots of appreciation, which I know is, is highly merited, and you've put years of your life into this. Thank you. Would anyone like to come off mute? Uh, make any comments or uh, questions of the on Gina's research or anything it's made you think about further or any uh, books or literature or films that you've thought of while listening to what Gina's been talking about. Catalina, uh, thank you for the first question. Uh, the question is, what practical advice do you give us PhD students looking at LGBTQ plus narratives in our own projects? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think the first thing that you have to do, based on my own experience, is question your own prejudices, question your own the foundations of your own identity in terms of class, class, the big one, nation. Um, Ethnicity, of course, uh, several several potential uh, streams um, into your own identity and question the pro the privileges that are happening because they're likely to prejudice your selection of texts. Like I said, like to begin with, the first maybe even two years, I didn't realize my own whiteness and how that had influenced the choice of texts that I was going to write about, and it took a real kind of awakening um, to understand my own whiteness and from there I was able to reconfigure the PhD so I so I went through a real kind of personal upheaval with that uh, so that's that's the first thing and and related to that read um, read the works of of people dealing with perhaps identities that you're looking at but from other countries from other cultures from other um, positions and perspectives regarding ethnicity and class. I think if you, you can do those things, it can open your eyes up to things that you never have thought of at the beginning of your studies. Thanks, Catalina. 
<laughs> Thanks, Catalina. Um, I hope that's helped uh, some other students in here, or uh, if there aren't any, you can share that, Catalina, uh, with others. Um, she replies, it has. Thank you so much. A smiley face. Thank you. I love smiley faces. For anyone who knows me, they know this already. Um, James, uh, would you like to come on camera and off mute and ask? I can come off mute. I don't know if you want to see me off on camera. And my question was, there's a documentary just come out on the BBC. It's called Lily, A Transgender Story. Um, I've downloaded it to iPlayer, but I've not had a chance to look, to watch it yet. But I wondered if um, Gina or anybody else here had, and if they thought it was a positive portrayal, or if it fell into some of the traps that Gina was talking about. So I'm embarrassed to say that I haven't seen it, although I don't look on BBC iPlayer because I don't have a subscription, if that's the word, but I should. I'm really glad that you told me about that because I, I'll absolutely find this now and, and maybe I'll be able to respond to it in a, in a future kind of newsletter or something on, on the Staff Pride Network or with a blog. Um, I hope that it's done justice. I hope that it's done justice to the fact that the book is produced by multiple authors, that it is a multi-genre um, book in effect, that sometimes you feel like you're reading a gothic horror in terms of Jekyll and Hyde. The book definitely plays with, with that kind of genre. Other times it's like a, a kind of a Mills and Boone romance and, and it's with a representation of femininity in a very kind of Ugh, Mills and Boone kind of way. Um, other times it's a medical drama. So in some ways I even think, because A Fantastic Woman, the film that came out, the, the Chilean movie, plays with this multi-generic kind of approach um, in, in, in the movie. It, it also kind of does surrealism. It kind of goes into this kind of slight ghost story at times. And other times it's to do with the realities of, of being a trans woman trying to get administrative, um, ad, well, trying to deal with administration. So I think it's important, first of all, to understand the complexity of Man into Woman, the original book by Lily Alba. I definitely recommend people read it. I think it's it's better than you think it's going to be, although, although because of the changes in tone and and you can tell authorship, it's a, it's a very complex text. Um, it was absolutely ripped to pieces by a lot of critics for a long time, and I was pleasantly surprised by reading it. I think the book I wouldn't advise reading is The Danish Girl by David Abishop, because it is such a reductive interpretation of a complex text. Um, but having said that, hey, you know, everyone has the right to, to write these books. My, my comment is only when it comes to Lily Alba, um, people need to search and investigate their own prejudices, their own biases, before they claim to speak on her behalf. So, um, but James, thank you very much for telling me about the, the iPlayer documentary. The one that I did see was Disclosure on Netflix, which I thought was really good. Um, so that is one I definitely would recommend. Um, but anyway, thank you, James. Hi James, thanks for your question. Is there, do you have any follow-up uh, points or questions or other uh, documentaries or films? No, not that, not that I can think of. I suppose maybe one, another um, book that I've definitely not read is J.K. Rowling's new um, piece. And I, I think, I suppose you'll agree with me that that's definitely a negative. Betrayal. <clears throat> Troubled blood. Yeah. yeah, I bought it. I bought it the other day on Amazon because I was writing a an article and I wanted to critique it. It's a huge book, actually, um, or it looks huge. Um, yeah, I've heard problematic things. I think what J.K. Rowling does is that she continues that twentieth century um, narrative, which it's. I guess it's a kind of cisgender anxiety with the kind of trans woman slash the kind of the cross-dressing kind of person who tries to get inside to hurt women. And it is definitely there in JK Rowling's um, essay on, on 
on Trump's identity as well. It's this blurring of horror with, uh, with trying to understand Trump's gender identity. It comes from a very anxious place. And in the past, I mean, I can kind of understand from a sympathetic point of view, I understand why, women, why cisgender women have this kind of anxiety of, of male violence and stuff. I think what Rowling needs to do is is get over that and understand that trans women are not connected to that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, she doesn't need to kind of question that, um, those feelings. But for example, one book that I read from the um, 1990s, Val McDermott's um, The Mermaid Singing, it's very similar, um, but it, it's much, because I haven't finished JK Rowling's book, I've only read like 100 pages, but Mermaid Singing it was written in the early 90s, got written just after, in fact, Silence of the Lambs. It's like the British version of Silence of the Lambs. It's this idea that someone would transition just to be able to hurt women. So this kind of story that Rowling is doing and is tapping into this anxiety, probably her anxiety, goes way back, at least since the 1960s with Psycho, Silence of the Lambs. Um, oh gosh, the film with Michael Caine. Um, but anyway, yeah, so it's, it's part of a long established tradition in which people are scared of, mm -hmm. of this figure. And it's, it's a shame um, that it, ha it had to come out, but people do write about these, these kind of fears. It is a very primal thing. Um, it's kind of conflating two separate things yeah, in the of our own um, political dogma. Exactly, and it's very dangerous right now. Um, it's kind of, my, my, my point was kind of as much as many really positive portrayals there are, there's almost as many really negative ones. Oh yeah, and the negative ones will will get into the mainstream. Um, in some ways, even more. Um, it takes yeah, it takes a remarkable kind of text by a trans writer, for example, to get into the mainstream, and it would have to be very mediated. Um, but yeah, J.K. Rowling is extremely established, obviously, and so yeah. Um, anyway, just to conclude on this. I've begun reading Troubled Blood. It didn't really seize me. Um, it's fine. I, I know where she's coming from on this because I can see parallels already with other books that have been written before it. Um, yeah, I would, so I don't know whether to recommend it or not as, as, a, as a great detective book, but obviously in, in something that conflates something like, I don't know, just gender blending um, with violence that is problematic and it's not very helpful at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I watched um, a trans activist, Rose of Dawn, who's very supportive of JK Rowling defending it, saying it's not about transgender identity. Mm -hmm. It's just about this kind of transvestic or fetishistic killer. And it's like, that kind of misses the point because mm -hmm. it's gonna be conflated, but they get blurred. When I read JK Rowling's essay, it gets blurred between male and trans and trans woman that is constantly being blurred um, in in the mainstream media as well and association between trans woman and male violence is constantly being blurred um, and jk rowling's new book troubled blood is do, is continuing in that tradition and it's not helpful to trans women that's for sure that's some really interesting points thank you <laughs> thank you as well jane Thanks, James. Um, the, I, I, not long ago, uh, watched on Netflix, Amazon Prime, I don't know, uh, Disclosure. Yes. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, James. Uh, have, uh, I can ask Gina what she thinks of it. Would you like to contribute? Have you seen it? I've not. I've there was something I'll put on my watch list. Yeah, uh, I would just like to say, I, I watched it. I don't remember that much, except that I thought that it was really good. So I definitely would recommend Disclosure. That, that's a very academic uh, <laughs> comment. <laughs> um, the, uh, no, I joke, I joke. The, uh, I know, I, know um, I find it really interesting, um, the concept of, uh, and, and relating as a as a gay man, um, I uh, I do try and highlight my own intersectionality yeah. that's invisible. I have a disability. I'm, I have epilepsy. Um, that uh, with the caricaturization of 
uh, homosexuality and uh, and TV uh, over the years, me growing up, uh, try seeing uh, what a gay person uh, is supposed to look like, uh, and then hearing uh, a lot of really insightful comments and stories from the uh, actors uh, in the film Disclosure, uh, the people of color, uh, the, the different glass ceilings that are just uh, so difficult, but the and how the representations uh, in media have, have uh, become more uh, more like the trans people I know. Yeah. Um, but then there's also that issue that you talk about, Gina, uh, of where it's the glamorous uh, trans uh, people who, who pass perfectly. Um, and and that's especially with the, uh, the the waiting lists that we have in this country. That's uh, very hard and to do. That, that people can take quite a long time until they feel like they pass. Uh, and <clears throat> can, can I, I just say something, Jonathan? Interesting and accessible for me, Jonathan. Can I just say something? Um, the issue of passing in itself, it's, it's problematic for me as well, because yeah, I, I'm a trans woman and, and I don't pass. And so when I see these amazing looking, I mean, cisgender passing um, activists, yeah, I'm absolutely proud of them. And I think they do an amazing job. You know, we can all think of examples like Sean Fay or Katie Montgomery on social media, um, all power to them. But I think it's, it's problematic when the role models tend to be ones who are cisgender passing because, because for example, facial feminization surgery, which I won't do anyway, whatever, even if I had the money, even if I had the 30,000 pounds that you would need for this, um, yeah, I wouldn't wanna do it. And I think it's a shame if trans people have to do it. So it is, it is also important to have narratives from a broad range of trans people just so that other trans people can know that it's okay. And also so that the cisgender public can know that, you know, <laughs> not all about cisgender passing trans women going into, you know, particular facilities. Yeah, maybe it's a trans woman who might look like me and that's okay because we're also just safe and we're just going about our business. So I think the issue of representation also has implications. It kind of um, desensitizes, not if that's the right word, it, it kind of blinds the cisgender public to the kind of range of trans people that are out there. And it doesn't always help trans people if the, the trans women that everyone sees are cisgender passing. It shouldn't be like that. I don't know what, how you get around this, but I guess more and more representations on TV and, and so on in the arts would show different types of trans women and trans men, of course, um, would be helpful. Does anyone have any uh, comments or questions? Uh, it's now 20 past seven, so we've gone on longer than we expected. Um, but uh, it's been really insightful for me uh, and lovely to have uh, people along tonight who uh, I don't see at our Staff Pride Network socials or, uh, regularly or um, people I've not met in person, I don't think. Uh, and I hope that you come to future events. Um, any other questions or comments? Catalina, please go ahead. Um, feel free to type if uh, if your audio isn't isn't working. There's a nodding there. Should we talk about something else while we're waiting, or do you want? I don't know. Do you have any other questions, Jonathan? Uh, when you were talking earlier, I was thinking about respect uh, and people respecting each other uh, and whatever uh, whatever anyone else thinks or does uh, we should all listen uh, and uh, respect and uh, you know you, you talk quite personally there and um, I uh, I've told you before that 
uh, but I, I don't agree. Uh, whether you whether you want to pass or not, uh, I think you're a beautiful woman. Uh, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. The, the respect thing. No. Totally. I think it's really a big problem at the moment, right? With social media, um, Twitter is the absolute worst kind of forum for fostering respect and it's also the principal way that we have of communicating as communities it seems to me or cross communities and i think that's been a big problem and we don't know who's doing the disrespect it could be anyone um so I, it's really a shame and i don't see any solutions in terms of twitter i just um yeah i just feel like we all need to be aware that what twitter is 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 only one way of communicating. I think the mainstream media doesn't help. I think um, when the JK Rowling furore happened um, in the summer around June, July, I wrote some articles some, because it was covered so negatively by the Scotsman and by the National in Scotland. I wrote counter articles um, to these newspapers explaining why I thought JK Rowling was being transphobic. And they didn't run those stories. And that was really frustrating. So I think the mainstream media could do a better job of, of showing respect to alternative voices. Um, that includes transgender writers. Millennials, for example, need more voice in the mainstream in writing about trans identity because there is a big generational gap. And at the moment, things seem very confrontational because there isn't much access in the mainstream to um, millennials, Generation Zs, and so on, to, to other trans members. They can't access those communities. All they've got is social media. And, and that makes it extremely difficult. And all this talk of cancel culture, mm -hmm. um, it's disingenuous, it doesn't help. And if the mainstream media gave more voice to the younger generations of trans people, I think that would be a big help. Yeah, there's, there's also, I think, this idea that everything the least bit contentious is a debate. So you've got to present both sides as being equally valid, which is just absolute nonsense. But it's something that the BBC in particular fall, fall, they fall for it. And ev every single positive um, positive thing that comes out from them is there's always this, you know, now we've got to ask a, a hate group for their view because we need to be balanced. Yes, uh, I, I very much agree with that. We've uh, we complained recently uh, about the uh, an article where LGB Alliance were invited uh -huh. to comment on a piece, uh, and um, yeah, it's it's a hundred percent agree. Um, I want to just uh, give Catalina uh, a chance. She took uh, the Catalina took uh, a lot of effort to. Uh, get the question across. So, uh, what are your thoughts about these topics in the context of Scotland? Um, so, yeah, you, we seem to, Catalina says, we seem to be in a very open and accepting country. So, how do these neoliberal ideas differ here? Yeah, I can, I can see where you're coming from, Catalina, because there, uh, there were, it was quite a global. And America, as you were focusing on, um, but what about Scotland? I mean, I still think there's there are inequalities in Scotland that we don't see in the mainstream as much. So, for example, um, I know in, in Edinburgh last year and the year before, there was a conference organised by the collective of um, queer, not just queer, but people of colour, um, called Resisting Whiteness, and they dealt with LGBT related issues, but they also dealt with um, inca ma mass incarceration and, and the issue of incarceration, as they see in, in Britain, the, the oppression by law and order um, against communities of colour. So it's difficult to know. Obviously, we're a very different country to the United, United States, but I also think there's plenty of ignorance, including on my part, as to um, just what people of colour are suffering and enduring in, in Britain. Um, 
so I think there is still a mainstream narrative that dominates that Britain is a, is a you know, a meritocracy, it's a very open society. Yeah, certainly from my experience as a white middle class trans woman, I, I have no problems on a daily basis. But as a, I kind of make clear in my PhD, what I experience is not necessarily what all trans women experience. And it's simply that there's a black hole in my own knowledge base. I'm very aware that there is racism. I've read books by, by um, academics and authors in Britain. Um, Rennie Edo Lodge, for example, of course, who talk a lot about racism in Britain. So I still think that um, in terms of neoliberal, it, maybe it's not just a neoliberal issue. It's, it's um, a kind of homo nationalist kind of thing where you're trying to present the country, your own country in the most positive way possible as a very fair and equal kind of society. You don't wanna talk about the bad stuff, the structural stuff, um, how certain groups get oppressed. People don't wanna know about this part of their society. Um, the majority do not. So it's, I think work needs to be done on this in the way that it has been done in Britain. And there are certainly writers like Nat Raha who, who write about, you know, and they have their own collectives, radical trans feminism, where they talk about racism and they talk about transphobia in ways that maybe a middle-class white trans woman like myself would, would, would not be able to kind of provide the same kind of insight. I also, can I just say one other thing <laughs> in terms of neoliberalism? Britain is definitely a neoliberal state. Um, the inequality is growing. Um, now more than ever with the pandemic. So things I think are only going to get worse. Unless, I don't see the current government. We've got all the voting patterns helping us. So the problems that are in America, I think they, they can come here as well to Britain. Mm -hmm. And I think there's maybe also false impressions of us in Scotland, our devolved government being far more progressive and far more left wing when we still have three year um, waiting times for GICs. So, you know, be under no illusion, Scotland is perfect. We might be better than some place, but we're, you know, being better than the worst doesn't mean you're good. No. And I think just before we close up, um, the Veronica, uh, oh, Catalina says thank you. Uh, and uh, Veronica, had, um, I was asking about Scotland as well. Hi, Veronique. How's your microphone? Hey, everyone. Hi, Veronique. Hi, Gina. No, I was, I was just thinking that um, I, I think what Jill, Gina is saying is, is very true. You know, Scotland is, is very liberal for some things. Um, but it also has kind of very obvious issues and there's this constant, even in relation to England, for example, you know, this, this constant discourse about us being better, um, which isn't necessarily um, supported by evidence. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's, it's certainly such a shame uh, that where Scotland was top uh, of lists for equality, diversity, inclusion, uh, it's other countries have gone ahead um, and other messages are coming out from all parts of Scotland, all levels. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we were uh, invited to sign the letter to the Scottish government, you might have seen. We uh, retweeted uh, just a week or two ago um, that was uh, with them about with politics and just these, it not being as liberal as it once was, it not being as forward facing as it once was um, and uh, and I hope uh, I hope by putting on these research seminars and and 
uh, all the, the other events that we put on uh, that people are learning, uh, are hearing uh, those voices that maybe they don't hear at work uh, in their team. Uh, they don't hear at their uh, squash club. Like, I play squash. I hear voices at my squash club. Whatever hobbies or interests people have, it doesn't include all voices. And especially uh, in Scotland, uh, like Gina said, and uh, with uh, Catalina's question earlier, it, it being a majority white country. So if you're going to get a range of views, uh, that's, then you've got to work hard for that. Uh, and uh, Staff Pride Network, we want to work hard to support people uh, in that. And if anyone here has anything that they'd like us to uh, work on, any projects or any uh, topics for future events, uh, we'd love to hear them. If maybe you're uh, researching uh, an area that you think might be relevant, uh, we'd absolutely love to, uh, love to uh, help you present your research. Uh, if you uh, think uh, that your research isn't far along enough, um, but you're starting on it, Catalina, I suspect, uh, then uh, we can bring more people uh, and have a, a panel event uh, with a number of people talking in the same area. Um, but uh, I think if, uh, as uh, Robbie's put in uh, the chat, I'll, uh, if you'd like to contact us in other ways, uh, follow us uh, on all our different social media platforms. Uh, we have videos on, YouTube, on our YouTube page from previous events, and this will be going up uh, in due course. Uh, I should have said at the start of the Q&A, if you hadn't uh, noticed at the start where we're recording, uh, if you'd like uh, your, um, uh, if you would like your uh, to be blurred out or your words to not be heard in the recording, uh, just let us know. Um, if you want to be private about it, you can private message me on here. Um, uh, but we would like to share this uh, recording, share Gina's research uh, as widely as possible. Uh, and we're delighted that uh, all of you turned up today. Um, Veronique is going to plug a resource uh, in the chat. Um, I'll mention that when it comes, uh, when they hit enter. Um, but uh, yes, we have uh, Twitter, Facebook. Um, we have uh, an Instagram, which is U uh, UOE Staff Pride as well. Uh, we have a, uh, the link to our blog page is really our own public website with links to all of these and um, lots and lots of stories that have appeared in our newsletters to our members uh, over the last four years. Uh, we've still got lots more to actually put up, um, but uh, work in progress. And for our members, we have a SharePoint page uh, where we launched today. Uh, we launched uh, Teams backgrounds, uh, where the, uh, such as the one I have behind me right now, uh, that any, uh, anyone can download uh, if you're not already on our mailing list and you'd like to be, and you're uh, a member of staff or PhD student, uh, you can join that way. And uh, same for the SharePoint. If you're not a member of the Staff Pride Network uh, and won't have access to the SharePoint, they are publicly available. Um, and Robbie uh, will, I'm sure, uh, pop that link uh, into the chat as soon as he can find it again. Two seconds. <laughs> uh, uh, Veronique. Uh, do you want to do you want to mention it, or would you like me to read out? 
no, I'm, I'm happy to say this is a new resource, um, which is, as the name indicates, primarily kind of anti racist, uh, but we have an intersection on uh, intersectionality. Um, and I, I, I would just appreciate, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm cis. Uh, it would be good to have various kind of gazes on it uh, to make sure that we are not omitting anything important or if you have resources that you would like us to add, um, we're very open. There's an email you can use on the homepage to make suggestions or, or criticisms, which we're very happy to take on board. Thank you very much. That sounds like a really worthwhile contribution. The, uh, yeah, I can see it there. The link works. Um, so uh, that looks incredibly uh, intensive. That looks like a lot of work's gone into that. Uh, I know because of the work that we put into what we do. Uh, so uh, congratulations already and good luck with that. Um, Gina, would you like to uh, add anything, conclude? to uh, finish off the event? Yeah, I did, I'm not sure. So in terms of my own, well, first of all, thank you everybody who, who's clicked on today to listen to me. Um, yeah, just to tell everybody, it's really tough right now. Um, even if you get a PhD, I mean, I'm, I'm now working in a warehouse, all teaching opportunities have disappeared. Um, just hang on in there whatever your situation, um, things are really tough. The world is going through a really weird phase, but ultimately uh, trans people are forever and uh, we'll get through it. Thank you very much for taking the time, Gina, and to everyone else. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you at an event in future. Uh, and if you've got any questions, any thoughts, comments, just get in touch.